1926, F. Scott Fitzgerald published a short story called The Rich Boy, and it started like this. Let me tell you about the very rich. They are different from you and me. Today, 88 years later, the biggest difference between the rich and the rest of America, beside money, is that when ordinary people, especially poor people, commit crimes, they go to jail. Even when those crimes are not worthy of the sentence, they go to jail. But when very rich people commit crimes, they don't go anywhere. And perhaps the worst thing about this inequity is that we have grown to just accept it. In his new book, The Divide, American Injustice in the Age of the Wealth Gap, Matt Taibbi argues that vast and pervasive inequality has made us, quote, numb to the idea that rights aren't absolute, but are enjoyed on a kind of sliding scale. The rule of law, he continues, has slowly been replaced by giant idiosyncratic bureaucracies that are designed to criminalize failure, poverty, and weakness on the one hand, and to immunize strength, wealth, and success on the other. We still have real jury trials, honest judges, and free elections, all the superficial characteristics of a functional free democracy. But underneath that surface is a florid and malevolent bureaucracy that mostly keeps the rich and the poor separate through thousands of tiny, scarcely visible inequities. Joining me now is First Look media journalist Matt Taibbi, author of the new book, The Divide, American Injustice and the Age of the Wealth Cap, which, I may add, debuted in the top ten of the New York Times bestseller list. Yes, thank Holla. you, Alex. Uh, so, so, Matt, let's start with a big sort of constitutional premise that we're all supposed to be equal under the law. Right. But then when you look how the law is applied, right. HSBC launders millions of dollars for drug cartels, gets off scot exactly hundreds of millions of dollars for mm -hmm. drug cartels, nothing, nothing happens. Right. First time offenders are locked up for months, years, decades. Right. It feels like the justice system, the law, does not treat everybody equally. Right. No, that's exactly true. I mean, look, there's, we have the law, and in, under the law, we're all equal, but there's a problem of prosecutorial discretion, where there's all this wiggle room, and it's a, it's a gray area. Uh, there, human beings get to decide whether or not they're going to apply the law to this person or that person. And that's, that's this problem that we found, we've fallen into, where prosecutorial discretion has kind of gotten out of control, where on the one side, we're simply no longer pursuing cases against a certain kind of offender, whereas on the other side it's become this gigantic, mindless punishment machine where if you get swept up in it, it's all over. I wonder, you know, there has been more talk about corporate wrongdoing. We had, um, uh, we had Benjamin Losky on yesterday who is designated by the governor to try and help clean up Wall Street. He doesn't have criminal prosecution powers, but it feels like there's a little bit more momentum to deal with at least that part of criminal actor acting. Sure. The big, giant, messy machine that you alluded to, which is the justice system for everybody else, right. seems like there is, there seems like there's less momentum in terms of actually meaningfully cleaning that up. Right. I totally agree with you, and I think the th the, there's a bunch of things going on here. Number one is there are people, other people on Wall Street who are frustrated by uh, these bad actors who continually get away with things, and not only do they not get prosecuted, but they stay in business, which upsets honest companies. Um, also, I think if we were to have another catastrophe like we had in 2008, um, I think there are already a lot of people in Washington who intellectually are already there in terms of we have to fix this problem, but they're not ready politically to commit to what it would take to clean up uh, Wall Street in terms of uh, doing a clean sweep. But if we were to have another crash, I think that would happen very quickly. What about, you know, you know there's some staggering statistics about what has happened in, the, the, in terms of criminal justice or lack thereof, especially for minorities. There are more African American men in prison or in jail on probation or parole than, there, than were enslaved in 1850. We had Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative on earlier this week, and I, I asked him, I said, how the hell did we get to this point right. where there are so many young black men locked up for offenses that will that were not serious enough to derail their lives in the way that they inevitably will. And he said a lot of it came out of the 1980s and this kind of very strict um, policy we had, this no tolerance policy on drugs and right. crime. But do you think we are at the point now, I mean that curve is shocking and distressing. It's unbelievable. Are we, are we at a point where we, are, we can acknowledge as a society the catastrophic failure of those policies? Well here's the problem with, with that policy and that catastrophe that you're talking about. The victims are all behind bars. 
ours, so they're not seen. Uh, so right. this is a major, a major national uh, political crisis that is simply invisible to most Americans. The only people who are experiencing it are the people who are either getting out of jail or getting out of prison or their families, and they don't have a very powerful lobby anymore in Washington. I mean, there was once upon a time when one of the major parties uh, advocated very strongly on behalf of uh, you know certain coalitions, but it's just not the case anymore. And um, I think uh, we're in, this is a problem of, of visibility more than anything else. That this this whole thing is just not seen by enough Americans. Well, and I think you also make this point: this contempt we have as a society for poverty. And I will read. I will not paraphrase it or read directly. He's great. <laughs> we have a profound hatred of the weak and the poor, and a corresponding groveling terror before the rich and successful. And we are building a bureaucracy to match those feelings. Now, you say to that too. I think some conservatives: well, who wants to be weak and poor? Nobody wants to be weak and no. poor. But people are weak and poor. Mm. And should we shunt them to to the side and? Sort sort of disavow them becomes the actual more fundamental question here. Right, and should they have fewer rights than every, anybody yes. else? I mean, look, we, you know, there's a program that I write about in this book called the P100 program where, where people who apply for welfare have to be preemptively searched by the state, uh, you know, in order to make sure that they're not lying on their welfare application. Well, I mean, that seems like a Fourth Amendment violation to me, uh, but or, uh, other people, bailout recipients, who are also a kind of welfare taker, uh, they don't have to go through that same kind of uh, that, uh, treatment. And the reason for that is because welfare recipients, on the whole, they're unsympathetic. We think of them as being parasites who are feeding off the rest of us, and everybody kind of looks down upon them and feels that they're a tremendous imposition. And and you can see this in the court system and the difference in the way that judges look at that kind of defendant versus the way they look at the white collar defendant. It's just, it's a psychological thing more than anything else. Yeah, I think one of the best parts of this book is that you examine these two sort of tracks, which is sort of corporate wrongdoing, right, white collar wrongdoing, and the way we treat everyone else. Right. And I can only imagine that being in those sort of two, being in those courtrooms and, you know, and seeing what's happening in corporate America was a shocking juxtaposition. It is. And actually, I mean, the subtext of this whole book is is my own sort of white guilt, you know, at not knowing how bad it was on the other side, yeah. and 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 discovering this uh, the, all these terrible injustices that were going on that I that I should have known about and I didn't know about. I think everybody should know about. I think so too, and so I encourage everybody to buy a copy of The Divide by Matt Taibbi. Matt, congratulations! Thanks for writing. Thanks this so book. much.